Until now, in this OLED display series, we have explored the SHT1306 controller datasheet, decoded the display module schematic, and walked through the code needed to interface it via SPI using both ESP32 and STM32 microcontrollers. Today, we are stepping up the game. We'll have an intro of LVGL graphics library, a powerful open source GUI library. Take a quick look at how to get started with it. Convert images to CRS using LVGL image converter and also bring Square Line Studio into the conversation. In our upcoming videos, we will discuss the source files in a brief and see how to render both text and images on our OLED display using both of our microcontroller platforms. If you haven't watched the earlier parts of this series, I highly recommend checking them out. Namaste and welcome back to Avinash Sheet Tech. Here we talk about embedded technology from understanding controller internals and hardware schematics to writing clean and efficient code for real world applications. If you are passionate about embedded tech, subscribe and join the tribe. Let's get started. So in the earlier video, we explored the Adafruit SHT1306 library. We ported its core functions into our own code base, made some essential modifications and explained the sections responsible for SPI communication and display initialization. But we stopped right after drawing individual pixels. Initially, my plan was to move on to the Adafruit GFX library, manually porting its functions for drawing lines, text and images. But then it clicked that this approach would lock us into a limited feature set and every single UI element would then have to be hard coded. That's not only tedious, but it slows down development and makes scaling the UI a real challenge. That's where LVGL comes into the picture. LVGL is light and versatile graphics library and it's multi-platform, works on different microcontrollers and also allows for much more flexible and scalable UI elements. So I decided to give it a shot. Right now, I'm on the official LVGL website and I've opened up the GitHub page as well. From there, I went to the release section and first I tried to work with LVGL version 9.0 and even the latest 9.3. However, I ran into multiple issues trying to make it run properly on our monochrome OLED. So eventually I rolled back and settled on version 8.4.0. This worked smoothly with my SSD1306 monochrome display. So here is the LVGL file opened. Here we have LVGL configuration template, some example files, source files, etc. Uh, we will discuss this in upcoming video, so no need to worry. Let me go ahead and quickly introduce you to some important points about LVGL. Obviously, it's open source and this graphics library, it can be used across multiple platforms to create UI elements like buttons, sliders, charts, and much more. Another cool thing that this is not just controller platform independent, but it is also display independent. Yes, it supports TFT displays, monochrome OLEDs, even e-paper displays. Now, the footprint of this library in itself is quite small. And here, please note that I'm talking about just the library not the display buffer. Let's check the requirements section. So first we have processor. We need a 1632 or 64-bit controller or processor. Well, both of our chips, the USB 32 D0WD, which is part of our USB 32 dev kit and STM32 F411 on our black pill board, both of this are 32-bit. So that's a check. Next comes clock speed. Minimum requirement 16 megahertz. No problem there. 
the USB 32 supports up to 240 MHz and the HTM32 F411 supports up to 100 MHz. Flash. Uh, okay, no, not this one. The memory flash. Yes. So we need more than 64 KB, but 180 kilobyte is recommended. Our USB 32 has an external 4 megabyte flash. So that's way too larger than the recommended. For HTM32 F411, we have 512 kilobyte of internal flash, which is still pretty good for most applications. And also keep in mind as your UI gets more complex, your flash usage will increase. Next is RAM. So at least 2 kilobyte should be reserved for static RAM purpose and the recommended stack size is 8 KB or more and recommended heap size is approximate 48 kilobytes. Next is display buffer. So we need this to hold at least one horizontal line of pixels. In our case, we have 128 pixels width. Since we are using a monochrome display, one pixel equals one bit. But for RGB 565 or RGB 888 formats, the memory requirement per pixel would be higher. So LVGL can flush one row at a time, or you can even increase it to 10 or more rows for faster updates. This right here is the partial buffer technique, which reduces RAM usage as compared to full frame buffers. So next is frame buffers. These are full screen buffers which are sized to your display resolution. In our case, that would be 128 cross 64 equivalent to 1 kilobyte as we have already discussed in our previous videos. But for larger displays like TFT, this can be huge and small RAM MCUs like our STM32 F411, they will struggle. The solution? Either just stick with partial buffers, we just mentioned it earlier, or pick another chip with more RAM. Now the available RAM right now for our chips for ESP32, that would be 520 kilobytes approx. For STM32 F411, that would be 128 kilobytes. So after subtracting stack and heap requirements, around 70 KB would be left for graphics. All right. Next is compiler, C99 or newer is required and that is no problem for our tool chains SPIDF and Cube IDE. Next knowledge, so we need basic understanding of pointer structures and callbacks to get started with LVGL. Nice. Let me show you a few examples available on the LVGL site. The first one here is a button. When you click it, it increases its count. Scroll down and you will find a slider that updates a value as you move it. LVGL also has a rich style system. You can add borders, shadows, custom backgrounds and more to your widgets. There are animations on events, button click actions, scrollable widgets and plenty of other ready to use components. And honestly, this is just scratching the surface. You can explore the full gallery and try them all out. All right, now we will talk about LVGL image converter. But before that, let me show you the list of images that I'll be using in later videos and display them on our OLED display using ESP32 and STM32. The first one is Mustache Man. Hat women, skyscrapers, tiger, and last is rose. Well, watching these images, I had a quick story in my mind. Mustache man met hat woman in a city of skyscrapers. Together they went on an adventure into tiger forest to find the mystical rose. Yeah, I know. That's pretty bad. I bet you can come up with something better. Drop your version in the comments. Anyway, all of these images are 128 cross 64 pixels 
and in BMP or bitmap format. You can use Paint, GIMP or any other online tool to resize according to your display's resolution and convert your image into BMP or bitmap format. Since we are working with monochrome display, I went with black and white images as they look the cleanest in this format. So now we have our images, but we need an array of bits to actually include them in our code, right? That is where LVGL image converter comes in. So we will navigate to the website and then select LVGL version 8. Set the color format to 1 bit indexed. Set the output format to C array. Upload our BMP image and click convert. Boom! The .c file is ready. Let me open this up in VS Code. Inside the image array, you will notice some additional bytes before the actual image data begins. These are nothing but color palettes. Here's how it works. First we have index 0, then we have index 1. For each index, we store a color in RGBA format. R here stands for red, G for green, B for blue, A for alpha, which controls opacity. So for example, if RGB, all of them are 255, that's white. If RGB, all of them are zero, that's black. If A is 255, the pixel is fully opaque. If A is zero, the pixel is fully transparent. After this palette entries, we have the main image data. This is arranged in bytes. But keep in mind, each bit here represents one pixel. The bit value determines which palette index 0 or 1 it refers to. By default, index 0 is used for the background color and index 1 for the foreground color. So if you ever want to invert the look of your image, all you need to do is swap the palette index order. No need to touch the pixel data itself. And that's basically it. The complete byte array of your image. Along with some extra metadata like resolution, array size and format details in the end. Let's now shift our focus to Squareline Studio. This software is pretty great. It helps generate C code for your LVGL setup based on the UI you design. Now I am no Squareline guru, but as promised, I will walk you through creating a basic UI for our monochrome display. The good news, Squareline offers a personal license for broke enthusiasts like me and maybe you. So no worries, just sign up with your email, verify it, download the software and grab your license. On their main website, you can always see your license details. So I have downloaded version 1.15.2 and now let me create a new project. I'll keep resolution as 128 cross 64. Color depth would be set to 8 bit. The LVGL version would be set to 8.3.11. Okay, okay, no need to worry. It will work fine with 8.4.0. Shape would be set to rectangle. Screen mode would be set to light. All right, so we have the screen with us. Now I will start by adding a panel to the screen and resizing it to a smaller size. Next, I will head to the style settings on the right hand side panel, enable the border color, let it be black, then enable border size and set it to one to keep the border thin but visible. I'll name this panel 1 and in the same way I will create panel 2 and panel 3. Resize them, set their border color and size and make sure all the three panels have the same width and height in pixels. You can even check and confirm this under the transform section on the right hand side panel. Along with equal sizing, I've also tried to keep 
the spacing between these panels as equal. Next, I will drag a label element into panel 1. This creates a child label under panel 1, which I will rename as label 1. I will set the text to HH, then adjust the panel size slightly to fit it. I will repeat the same process with panel 2 and panel 3, renaming the labels to label 2 and label 3. For label 2, I will set the text as MM and for label 3, I will set the text as SS. Finally, I will add one more panel, panel 4. Resize it to hold a date and day and then place a label inside it as well. This would be named label 4. Alright, now I will type the text. For example, let's say 15th August 2025 Friday. So we are all set. And if you are from India, you know this date is the Independence Day celebrations. Anyway, back to the UI. The idea is simple. I will replace the HH, MM and SS placeholders with real time values. So this generic UI becomes specific later on. So in short, this would be a clock kind of UI with our hour, minute and seconds value and a day and a date like calendar. But I won't be using an RTC for now it would be just some random timing value which would be updating every second so as to represent or mimic a real digital clock and demonstrate the concept on our ESP and STM controllers but that would be shown in an upcoming later video. Once this design is done, we will click export UI and this gives us LVGL supported code. Let me open that up as well. So here we have our basic UI source files and elements. Don't worry, we'll take a look at this also in the next video and we'll also suggest you few small tweaks that is needed to get this running perfectly on our controller platforms. So yeah, with this we have got our basics for LVGL and Squareland Studio all set. In the next video, we will take a closer look at the source files and break them down to make things simpler. Hang tight. Till then, give this video a like, share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe. This is Avinashi Tech signing off.